and welcome to Join Generations, The Future is Young and Old. I'm so excited to be here today. My topic that I will cover today is thinking and acting across generations. Thank you so much, Andrea, for the effort you put in here to bring us all together for such an amazing summit. And I know how much work you have put into it the last couple of months. So to begin with, I would like to briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Irene Kilubi. I am located in Germany, Munich, and I have um, founded the Joint Generations Initiative um, approximately one and a half years ago. And uh, our aim is to bring different generations together. As you can see here, we have a clear vision which is a world in which all generations work together to shape a more sustainable and livable future based on mutual respect, trust, and communication. Therefore, we derive our mission, we build bridges to overcome obstacles that arise, foster sustainable dialogues and collaboration between generations and create transformation in thinking and action, which is very, very important for us to create a transformation in thinking and action, not only talking about the importance and urgency of this topic, but also to um, create an impact. So we cover different subject areas. We have 10. Um, they are closely related to the so-called SDGs of the UN. Um, we are mostly rooted in SDG number eight and SDG number 10. SDG number eight um, is all about decent work and economic growth that we try to foster through strong generations. And then we have SDG 10 to reduce inequalities. So as you can see, many aspects are covered. For example, gender, then cultural background or physical or mental impairment. However, the dimension of diversity, which is age, and we're talking about is totally missing there. And this is one of our aims to change that. Definitely, you see definitely age dimension as one part of a major um, diversity debate. So looking on the left-hand side, you see that we cover 10 um, topic areas. So um, for example, new work, new learning, entrepreneurship, innovation, mobility and sustainability. So to give you an example, if you look at the dimension human resource and recruiting, what we're aiming to do here is to um, create awareness about the job descriptions that um, many companies place out there. Most of the time they mention, we are looking for someone young and dynamic, which is not a good thing to do so because people that are a bit older might feel um, discriminated and uh, maybe feel um, intimidated to apply for this job. Another aspect uh, might be, um, of course, new technologies and digitization, where we definitely see elder population should be also included in the whole setting because we're talking about our future here, right? And every age should be included. To begin with, I would like to talk about the scientific foundation that is behind it. Here, for example, I have a recent sample of a survey of companies and institutions, also universities, that revealed the following sentiment. Nearly 60% of all employers that were surveyed stated that there was a significant added value from cross-generational collaboration. And nearly 43% perceived mixed age teams as Sorry, you went mute. You have to check your voice. It's, it happens sometimes. Just try it again. I can't see that it's unmute for me. Okay, let me check the YouTube. On Zoom, I'm not on mute. All good. Okay, it's back. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, nearly 43% perceive mixed age teams as more creative and successful overall, right? And yes, my question would be like, for example, Andrea, do you agree with that? Do you have any experiences with mixed age um, teams and um, how was it for you? 
I think it's it? always better when you have youngsters and, and the wise generation together. Because when they start to open up to each other and they really accept each other, then really beautiful things happen. I see the different perspectives, the different ideas. It's kind of like the diversity is coming out and it's powering the discussion. So it's really, really nice. Have you always been working in age diverse teams or was there a time where you said like, okay, I was mostly the youngest or mostly the eldest or whatsoever? I remember my first job after, I'm not even after diploma, but it was just my first uh, internship before I got my diploma. Uh, that was the, the time when I was the youngest. So it was kind of a different experience. Yeah, I, t I can totally relate to that because when I finished my studies and um, started working at BMW in the department where I was uh, employed, I was 25. The next older people was person was 43. So we had an age difference of 18 years. It was a totally different experience, you know, because they always perceive me as I'm so dynamic, energetic, and they say, yes, yes, you, we know, you're young, you want to change things, you still have the drive, just wait a couple of years, it will change, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it was really um, interesting, um, yeah, experience for me, and when I, I, I had a podcast with a very young girl, who was, I think, 18, 19 years old, and um, she worked or still works for Salesforce. And um, she said like, okay, I asked her like, what do you really like about the culture working there? And then she said, um, I really like that everyone has fun and is dynamic and that I'm being even accepted by the old employees. And I said like, okay, uh, what age? She said between 26 and 30. And I said, oh, okay, <laughs> that's old for you. And she, she started laughing. Because in fact, that's for her was old, you know, because being 18, 19, everyone between 26 and 30. And we, we mustn't forget that uh, pretty much younger companies, they have a really um, young average age, right? So um, like most of it, like companies like Google, Microsoft or American uh, companies that um, are there like only 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, most of the time they don't have people that are much older than 35 years. And it's also our perception, I believe, that uh, we always think that we are still young. No matter how old we are, you know, we don't feel that we get older. So it's no. kind of like you relate yourself like it's your your youth, but it's not your youth anymore. You are already another. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and uh, it's fantastic what you're saying, because one of my colleagues once said to me, um, no one thinks that he's getting or she's getting older. She said, like, you don't only think, oh, they're looking more and more younger. <laughs> you know, and, you know, so I'm also a university lecturer. And sometimes when I enter the room and I see them like um, early 20, and I said, like, did I also look so young when I was 20? <laughs> because for me, they look like very, very young. Um, yeah. And there was also someone that I met on LinkedIn. She wrote me a private message and uh, she said like, oh, now I'm perceived as old. When did that happen? So where, where's the boundary? When you, do you start getting old, right? So let's come up to the next scientific foundation, which is younger and older employees have different strengths and competencies that can complement each other. Mixed age teams also offer the opportunity for intergenerational knowledge transfer. Yes, what is your opinion on that? Do you, can you relate to it? Do you feel that this suits well? Or do I you think, maybe challenges? I, I think it's harder because what I heard from the youth, even throughout this conversation, what we had in the summit, everyone is saying that the youth is a little bit afraid to speak up because they respect the elderly a little bit more, but then also the elderly are protecting somehow their status. So this is creating a big gap. So they don't talk to each other most of the time because of this gap that is in between, because they, they are not willing enough to, to bravely speak to each other. But that's a good point you're mentioning here, right? Because, um, most of the time, it is in this case that um, the younger people, 
they feel like um, uh, older employees have some sort of prejudices against them and, um, on the, and are afraid, as you said, to speak up and feel not uh, really appreciated from time to time. Like, oh, you're too young, you can't take on responsibility and uh, first start to work and then you will see in a couple of years, right? And the other way around, older employees, they um, feel like, okay, they, they want to change everything. They feel they, they know everything better. So my recommendation to young people is always, you know, respect what has been there because you don't know what kind of struggles they've been facing in the past, right? And ask your questions first and show interest, show appreciation for what they are doing, right? And um, don't come across like, you know everything because you don't know anything because what you learn at the university is totally different from the real world, right? And so sometimes when I teach my, um, my students, I say like, what you learn here is the perfect world, the perfect theories, perfect methods and so on. But real life, the good ones will make, make the leap because those are the ones who can adapt their knowledge, you know, and they can um, cope with different circumstances. Those are the ones, and not people who are coming to the companies and saying, this is the method, this is the way it should work. And I just learned it at university and so on. You also need practical ex um, experiences, right? So that's my 50 cent or two cents on that. Right? <laughs> and of course, um, as you mentioned, there are sometimes also conflicts. Um, it's really important to, to see it as a, as a benefit, as a win-win situation, right? Because of course, there's a lot of things that young people can learn from older people. However, the other way around also applies, right? In particular, in terms of digitization. So it's a win-win situation for both parties. And um, I, I guess that's the reason why we're talking about such topics to, so that people aren't afraid, right? While coping in this, um, setting and I will come to it in a bit because we will also have like um, totally different um, leadership um, constellations in the near future and then we come to um, yeah a statement that um, also addresses the challenges that might come across here um, a professor from Germany says consequently communication between old and young at the corporate level only contributes to maintaining innovation and competitiveness if it functions smoothly. Because there are many school of thought that um, claim that definitely age diverse teams foster innovation. However, um, you should also bear in mind as with any other diversity topics as well, if um, in particular, because I, I see um, leader, leaders as the, as the link between generations, if um, they are not devoted to it, if they don't have a concrete strategy plan, um, it starts with a good onboarding process in place. It can also lead to several frictions. And that's what this statement really, really uh, makes obvious, right? So as you can see, I would really like to emphasize on this expression communication because I feel communication is the root of everything, right? Um, even in society, any conflicts that we have is based on miscommunication, wrong communication, or no communication at all. This can sometimes even be worse than um, having a bad communication because you can work on it, you can improve it, but if you don't have the room where different generations can come together and exchange their thoughts, ideas, it uh, might really lead to those um, aforementioned conflicts. And then I really, really, really like this statement. The actual age of a person and occupational performance are not systematically linked. By the way, I forgot to, to ask, like, um, what would be your definition of ageism? Ageism, it's like... Uh... I could uh, describe it with an example, like people say yeah. that you are too young for this position or you have too much experience, <laughs> the two I love different it. sides. <laughs> I, love I think it. that Definitely. explains. 
yes, you're pretty smart because most of the time when uh, people think about um, age discrimination or ageism, they think only about being old, but it can also be the opposite, right? So in fact, you uh, nearly nailed it. Uh, for me, ageism means like either someone says you don't possess the capabilities and the skills right now to do some, uh, a certain thing, or you don't possess the skills and capabilities anymore to do something, all right? So it's both ways. And uh, sometimes um, also young people feel discriminated, right? Because it's a sort of discrimination if someone says, just because you are too young, again, what is too young? In my perception, too young to do something, it's sort of discrimination because studies have shown that your occupational performance is not linked to your age. It's totally nonsense. It also has to do with your mindset and your circumstances, how you grew up. And also you need to coin the word here, um, uh, um, lifelong learning is also an important factor here, right? I know people that stop learning with 2025, but I also know people 60 who are still learning and eager to prove themselves and to better themselves every day. So um, you can't go there and say, for example, that's one of the major prejudices that older people, for example, face, that they are not so familiar with digitization and I, um, like younger people. And I say like in certain, to a certain extent, yes, it might be true, but it has nothing to do with their brains. It has to do with the context they grew up. Of course, someone who's nowadays 14, 15, 60, 20 years old, it's a natural thing to deal with all the digital tools and new technologies, right? It just has to do with how I grew up, the context I live in. And of course, someone living, I don't know, in, um, in a poor country, uh, not having the access to digital tools, of course, it doesn't mean that that person is stupid. No, it just means like he doesn't have the possibility, opportunity to grow up naturally with those tools and methodologies. And the same applies for different age groups. So, in fact, what are the major challenges when it comes to age inclusion? So we have to consider two different perspectives. We have on the one hand side, the micro, um, macro um, economic perspective and also the micro one. So I will touch on the micro perspective, which involve the corporate level. So I see here three major challenges. The first one is of course, leaders need to learn how to manage the collaboration between young and older employees. If we look, for example, at the public sector, they had the major challenge that many, many employees in the near future will retire. And on the other hand side, they have to learn how to attract younger generations to work for them. Because the public sector most of the time still have this conservative, very um, limited, um, how to say, um, the way that people perceive them. Young people say like, oh, maybe it's a boring place for me. I cannot uh, be creative. I cannot um, develop my own concepts and so on. So this is the balance that they need to, to juggle. And then very, very important, there'll be more asymmetric leadership constellations in the future. What does it mean? It means that we will have to, we will face many situations where young people will be leaders of older people. This is again, another challenge. And last but not least, the first and foremost challenge they will face is to, to, to somehow balance out different needs and value atti um, attitudes of many different age groups. And I will come to in a bit, in a bit right? Because um, we are not talking here about um, prejudices saying that uh, young people are this way, older people are this way, but um, studies and uh, sociologists have proven that there is in fact certain differences between age groups, but I will come to it a little bit. As you can see here, you have probably come across those different expressions, Gen Z, Gen X, baby boomers, and so on. So 
we don't want to judge people or say like, okay, because you are uh, born between 1965 and 1980, you belong to a generation X and you are deaf this way, this way, this way. No. What we're just trying to cluster the different um, ages into groups and those clusterization is based on different, um, so to say, identity features. As you can see, like, depending on which time I grew up, how I've been raised by my parents, uh, based on the way the working culture was in the time I grew up or started working, um, those age groups, so they say, uh, mm, we could say they, they, they have a certain identity that influences the way they think, the way they act, the way they behave, in particular, also at workplace. Let me give you an example. For example, uh, the baby boomers or Generation X, the most important thing for them was to have a secure job, to um, stay as long as they could possibly do at one um, employer's place, so most of the time when they finished their apprenticeship or studies, they started working for one employer and stayed there until they retired. And then of course, they had the situation, most of them have to decide what is more important, family or career, in particular women at that time. It was nearly impossible during the 70s or 80s for a woman uh, to pursue a career and having a family at the same time. And nowadays it's more and more common to see those constellations. Many people doing their career, many women doing their career and still having a family. So as you can see here, uh, most of the time uh, we talk um, about people starting from the baby boomer generation because those are the people who are still working right now, right? And then uh, followed by the generation X, then, um, Next come generation Y. This is the generation where I belong to. I guess you too, Andrea, right? You're also part of generation Y. I can't hear you. Uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, Y. I think eighty two, right? It's it's a Y. Yes. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. And then we have the generation Z until two thousand and sixteen. And guess what? <laughs> That's not the end because the next generation, so the alphabet starts uh, from new again, is the generation alpha. And uh, scientists and um, academics are already started, uh, starting to talk about them and doing research on them. So uh, we could say like um, generation <laughs> Z is starting to mature and the next generation will be the generation alpha. So um, maybe they will grow, grow up naturally with artificial intelligence. They will grow up um, naturally with uh, robotics and so on, right? As you can see is the most important factor while dealing with challenges is the first thing is always to rec uh, recognize that there is a challenge. So those challenges can uh, tackle many different areas. Um, I already mentioned communication is a major factor than uh, the way the different generations think and act and feel, of course, then it can lead to disagreements. It can lead to tensions. Um, so what in fact can I do as a leader, for example, to act upon those challenges? It can be like um, holding regular events, active listening and exchanging, Lots of uh, conversations. I will come a bit in a bit um, on talking about the different methods that you can also apply. So how do you successfully lead different generations in fact? Of course, the first step is to take into account the expectation of younger generations, as well as those of older generations. It seems pretty easy and simple, but I can tell you the reality is sometimes very tough and challenging. Right. And then also to enable mutual appreciation and dialogue, really to appreciate any any age group. Right. I can give you an example. Um, 
it was last year when I had dinner with one of my ex-colleagues from a, a, a major corporate. And he's a team leader in the department. And he told me, ah, oh, I just, um, I just um, have a new employee from fresh, a fresher, a fresher from university. And guess what? He went to the human resource department uh, because he was not happy with my leadership style. And I said like, okay, what happened? He said like, um, he told the human resource department um, that I'm giving him a stupid and st silly assignments that um, he doesn't want to do every day the same thing. He wants to have um, some balance in his activities and so on. And I actually was really, really mad. And he really started talking about the typical prejudices um, to say like the one was a fresher, I guess, mid 20. And my ex colleague was end of 15. He said like, um, he's so rude. He should start working first, right? And not uh, entering a company, being here like only four or, or four weeks and um, asking uh, me to do him um, favors. He should prove himself first, right? And he said, like, I, I can't believe it. Um, when I was young, we would never have thought of doing so, right? And um, yeah, what do you think was my recommendation to him? He was very, very mad and very angry and he couldn't believe it. You know, he said, like, yeah, he's mid-20, he just finished university. Um, he doesn't want to work. And um, yes, the next thing that he'll ask is for sabbatical. Come on. <laughs> I will let you let you tell this one. <laughs> I cannot assume. <laughs> oh, we have also someone in the chat. Yes, uh, Simfong is here. He is from the wise generation. <laughs> oh, fantastic. He says active listening is mutual. Definitely. Is the younger generation listening to the older generation? That's the thing. You know, you totally nailed it. It should also be the other way around. Yes, I just recommended him like to stay calm and to say like, this is a totally new generation and um, to show a little empathy because for him, right? He probably worked in a different setting. You've been working for, I would say old conservative companies where it's common practice, like what the leader said should be done, right? And you were never supposed or even asked to bring your own thoughts and ideas in. So be happy for the new generations that they have the, the opportunity, right? So try to talk to him and listen to what he also actually wants and try to explain to him, like, you've been here 20, 30 years in this company, what kind of challenges you've been facing and what your expectations are. And I think it's all about expectation management. The first thing while entering a job relationship is always to do expectation management. Because with, with no expectation management, there'll always be a miscommunication. How often have I heard the sentence, oh, I, I, oh, then I misunderstood. I thought you wanted this way and this way. Or I, I believe that I should do it this way, right? Ah, Shin Fong says, you have a baby boomer. If you want to, you can also unmute yourself and um, talk to us. Welcome. Thank you very much. I am actually a baby boomer. Much earlier one. Much earlier one. Yeah, close to the boundary. Uh -huh. Where are you located? I've uh, been generation gap and uh, I'm paying attention. I'm listening. Fantastic. Where are you located? Melbourne. Melbourne. Oh, Australia. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Yes. You know, many times when I work with my clients, um, the first question that they ask me is, what do the young people need? We need to attract them. It can be from an employer's perspective. It can also be from a branding perspective. What do the young need? And that's for them also closely connected to new work. Can you guess what I tell them? What is my answer? Ask them. <laughs> That's a very good question as well. Or 
answer reply. What do you think, Xing Feng? I have no idea. I don't think I'm a young generation. Uh huh. Okay, I'll show you what my answer is. I said that's the wrong question, but I said it in a polite way, of course, right? <laughs> that's the wrong question. What do people need to work better individually and as a team? That should be the correct question. And what corporate culture supports the needs and desires of the workforce? Right? Because it doesn't lead to it doesn't lead me to anywhere if I'm only focused on the young people, but I have a workforce where also many older people are there. You understand my way of reasoning, right? Yes, I think it's uh, it's clear. And I was thinking about the company culture, like just focus on the company culture and the right people will come to you if you are living the mission and the vision and, and then attract Absolutely. the right people, right? <laughs> Absolutely agree because um, it shouldn't be so much focused on the age. It should be focused on is there a culture fit between the employees and um, our company values, our company culture. And I really loved it when I was also um, holding a podcast. I interviewed also um, a young lady and she said, I wouldn't like to work in a work environment where everyone is my age because I feel that I'm not learning anything new. I only have the mindset and perceptions of people who have the same age as I do. And she said like, my role model is my father, you know, because she, she was also uh, working in the technical part, um, also studying, uh, she studied um, IT. And she said like, I can learn so much from my father rather from someone um, who is, knowledgeable but still not so experienced yet because you can't be experienced um experienced um programmer for example if you just um come from from university right now because you don't have the practical experience right this is the one that is lacking and i really like to statement to say like i i wouldn't feel comfortable in a work environment where everyone is young yeah. and something yes please shin Okay, you, you just say, wow. <laughs> or did you want to say something? In general, okay. I think, in the, sorry, I just got you interrupted. We talk about the, uh, uh, an organization culture. Now, uh -huh. yes. how do we define the culture? Because if, you are, if the company started with the older generation, so how do they define their culture when new, new, new blood comes in and their younger generation? They're not going to fit into that culture. Yes, I, I can understand what you, you say. Like um, it's always based, company culture is always based on values and also certain mission and vision that the company pursues, right? And you're totally right. Um, but the thing is, you, I believe that every company should uh, be based on values that many people can agree on, you know? Let me take you for example. Um, a company says like one of our major values is sustainability, right? And I feel that's a value that uh, both the young and the older generation can very um, much relate to, right? What you are referring to, I guess it's more like the way of working, the way of processing work, right? Because the values can always, Stay the same over centuries away, but the company can change the way they are working, in particular when we talk about new work. As you know, uh, many companies are introducing flexible working modes, are introducing remote offices, and so on, right? And of course, it's sometimes new for the older generation and the younger generation can uh, much more relate to it. However, it's the task of the company to make it in a way so convenient that everyone can feel comfortable, right? To provide them with many different options, right? Because there will also be young people who will say like, okay, I don't like this 100% uh, remote work thing. From time to time, I wanna have like uh, a common ground where I can come to the company and also exchange with other colleagues.
Shin Fong. <laughs> yeah, I'm listening. I think I'll, I'll keep my questions to to last uh, because I think you. Uh, let me hear more about what you say first. Yes. Thank you. Totally welcome. Great. So, what can managers and leaders do? In fact, it starts with recruiting to make it common na nature, to make it common practice in the organization to recruit age diverse teams, right? And I've experienced many companies, departments, you will see like in one department, you see like mostly people over 40, for example, in another department, you will see very, very young people. And I feel that's not very effective. You should mix them up. Then also to promote knowledge transfer, I will uh, give you some examples in a bit. And here, very important without seniority principle, to always say like, there's expressions called reverse mentoring. Not to always say like, it's always the case that younger people teach older people. And I can also tell you from my practical example, it was like two or two and a half years ago, someone from my network approached me and asked me, hey, um, Irene, do you wanna be my mentor? And she is 20 years older than I am. And I was so surprised. I said, like, why, uh, why uh, are you asking me to be your mentor? Normally, it should be the other way around. I should be supposed to ask you to be my mentor. She said, no, no, because you have the skills that I need and I can learn from you those skills. And at that moment, it clicked into my head because I thought she's absolutely smart and forward thinking. Because this is the way it's supposed to be, that you are older than I am, therefore you are my teacher. No, you have the skills, capabilities, and knowledge of something that I lack, therefore you can teach me something. It can also be someone who's the same age as you are, it doesn't matter. And then of course, one major aspect is also training and further development as well as empowerment. And what I notice most of the time organizations is they have many trainings that also segregate different age groups. For example, leadership trainings, only leadership uh, people, executive, and most of the time they have a certain age. Or like um, workshops for interns, workshops for um, apprentice, junior workshop programs, and so on. And I feel, why don't we bring all of them together, right? Maybe mix executives together and mix uh, interns together because I feel that it could be a mutual benefit for both parties. And then to briefly show you some figures, um, as you can see, there's a huge difference between what companies invest in the older workforce and what they invest in the younger workforce. And you will also see that the topics are different. For example, for the older workforce, you find, of course, health promotion, something that you will not find for the younger workforce, right? Although I strongly believe you can't start early enough with promoting your health, in particular in the workplace. But what is really striking on me is the first point, continuing education. 85% investment for the younger workforce and nearly only half of it for the older workforce. That's pretty sad, right? Seems like organizations are thinking like, okay, once you have reached a certain age, you don't need to learn anymore or don't need to learn so much anymore, right? However, what do you feel? What is the, the reason why some companies, they wouldn't say it openly, rather prefer to engage more with younger people than with older people? There's one simple reason. What do you think, Xing Fong or Andrea? I love this. I just love to listen to it. This is my field. I want everyone in the same room at the same time without any labels. I mean, you know how I am. <laughs> you are yes, just uh, confirming now everything what I'm, I'm trying to tell to people. It is just scientifically also proven by, the, by your numbers. So thank you very much for that, Irene. <laughs> yeah, 
You're welcome. Xing Feng, you wanted to say something? I haven't stopped learning. In fact, I spent more time reading and learning during the pandemic than all my life. <laughs> then, Definitely, the, right. The, the, problem, the problem is a lot of older generation. It's not that they don't want to continue uh, their improve, continuing, uh, continuing their improvement or education. It's just that as they grow older and maybe within an organization, they get promoted and they have to spend more time at work and their mm -hmm. responsibility as well. They have responsibility as work, at work as well as respons responsibility at home. And therefore, the time is really limited for them. So if they are added, they have the added burden of studying, that means they have not, no, no life at all. For the younger generation, it's different. They, they, do not have, they do not have a financial commitment to some extent. They do not have family commitment. So their, their life is pretty free. So they do have a lot of time to study. They do have a lot of time to do something else. I think that is not because that the older generation don't want to continue their education. If someone pay him, don't have to go to work, well, fine, they will do it. They will just go to a college and university. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's Absol all I, I totally, want. Yes, I totally agree. And um, you also received a message uh, from Jürgen Bubeck. Hello, Jürgen. <laughs> He's also from Germany. And... Um, He says um, that um, baby boomers are valued as bridge builders to the youngers and big supporters of diversity and inclusion. And this is also a topic he recently discussed with you. Thanks a lot, hello, uh, hello Jürgen, and thanks a lot for your input. So it um, also goes into the direction what we are discussing here. And I love this idea. In this case, I would also like, like to give you an example. Most of the time, when we think back of our time when we went to school, right? It, most of the time we felt like, oh, it's boring. And sometimes, why do I learn these things? Will I need it in the future uh, for my personal or for my um, professional life? Yeah. And when we grow older and have children, and children complain about the same thing we complain in the past, most of the time, the response is, we had to face the same issue, get along with it. And I say, why? Just because you have experienced it, so the following generations should be facing the same issues now. You should be there to help them out. You get my point? The same thing with the topic work-life balance. I published an article and there was one person um, entering a comment complaining and saying like, oh, um, do you mean that we don't need any work-life balance? And I, I think it's so stupid of the younger they're always um, asking for work-life balance. We didn't have it in the past. We didn't even know this, this expression. And I say like, No, what I'm trying to tell you is that every one of us needs work-life balance. But the thing is, the difference between the older and the new generation is that the younger generation are asking for it. And I'm sorry, you probably didn't have the, the, the context. You were raised in a different way. You grew up differently, that you didn't have the opportunity right, to claim for it. But now the young generations have the opportunity to so support them rather than complaining about their behavior. And that's my point of view on that. Work together and in particular, um, the younger generation needs the older generation to make our society, our life a better place to, to be. And I think I have some point to add here. Like it's the fact that you were born before when it was still not available and you were living in a in a world which was not as bearable or less bearable it just doesn't, doesn't justify that the future cannot be better right really exactly and it doesn't justify that even even if you had this, those issues that um the others have to face the same, same issues right it's totally doesn't make any sense right because we want our future to be better even if i grow up i want the future to be even better uh for the for the following generations than it was for me right 
I mean, um, psychologically is understandable what the person is going through. It's just the awareness that is not there, that it doesn't have to be the same way, right? So it's kind of like, exactly. it's, it's a weird situation because first you have to break all these meats that it has to be the same way. And then you can educate the person that, oh, maybe there is a better way for the future. So it's good because the next generation will not suffer from it, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely got the point. <laughs> So what me methods can help to, as a Jürgen uh, coins did, to bridge the gap between the generations? Of course, it's common practice in the US. I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, but uh, speaking for the German king, uh, speaking areas, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, it's not uh, pretty common to hire senior interns. That's what um, US American companies do, in particular during the onboarding process to have someone who's already experienced and has the time. Because most of the time, it's we also have this issue. Of course, there's someone uh, internally from the company still working there, but he doesn't have so much time to uh, support the new employee. So it's always a good thing to have someone external. It can also be someone who used to work in the past for the company and has now retired. And then of course, job tandems and mentoring. Here we have to um, consider the difference, you know, because there are some uh, personal development measures that are on the job and some that are off the job. Job tandems, it's most of the time on the job, which means that they share common activities during um, their working activities. And then you have mentoring with it, which can also be off the job that doesn't necessarily need to take place during work, right? So job tandems have a higher level of involvement, but also require a very good planning uh, within the company. And mentoring is something that you can also do from time to time. Uh, it can also be like a meeting um, your, so to say, um, mentee after work for lunch once uh, every other week for one hour. But job coming really, really requires to work closely together. Um, most of the time during a certain lim limited or defined time frame, which can be two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, really putting yourself in the in the in the shoes of the one who's mentoring you and vice versa okay this is it from my part um oh we're well in time actually i was supposed to do a little exercise uh with you however i would like to open um the q a session with you and all right, let's do that. So I have the first question and then after I will give it, give the mic to Simfong. Like uh, we had a conversation uh, back uh, yesterday and on Clubhouse about generations and what is stopping people to work together. And I was having a thought which was a little bit less clear yesterday, but it got more clear after listening to you. Like this segregation of the different labels, women, men, uh, young, old, and all these things is kind. Is it kind of like a marketing tool that people are using now, overusing now today to create gaps, or it is just it is a useful tool. You can you can use it for a good uh, thing if you know the different generations and you know what is their different habits, skills, and all these to use it in the workforce to make the company better. So what's what's here the what what would be here the balance? Like are are people overusing these things, the different generation labels and using it for marketing to differentiate people and create this kind of uh, hype words or marketing words like Gen Y, Gen A, let's go sell them more or is it some very beautiful tool if you use it for a good cause? I wouldn't necessarily um, emphasize too much on those categories, right? For me, I just use it as a tool to simplify things instead of saying everyone who's 49 till 70 or whatsoever, right? And it has been scientifically um, developed, right? But of course, I totally agree with you in some, um, some areas such as in marketing, 
it's commonly also used as marketing strategies. But in fact, um, what I'm telling you, what is the point in fact, right? It's only as a, as a means on how to better, for example, segregate your, your target groups. Um, in fact, companies could also go there because it doesn't change anything. Because when companies say, I want more younger people, they could go there and say like, um, I want to have more people between 18 and 25, right? But they could also say like, that's what they say most of the time. We are interested in attracting the Generation Z. Understand? It's the way you are using it and how you, you work with those expressions. I use them just for simplification. So not and for also, segregation, but for kind of like out and identifying the different groups and, and then helping your work while identifying what are the needs and what are the skills and, and how they be behave actually, right? Yes, and um, yes, I, I, I wouldn't also take it um, so personal because there are some people who take it very personally, right? Um, because it's the same like when I label someone, students, I, I, I label someone, you know what I mean? mother you know okay it has nothing to do with the age but as someone who has retired also certain i could also say like everyone above um in germany you uh, right now you retire with 65 i guess so everyone above 65 you know instead of saying like all people that retired you understand what i mean i i, I wouldn't take it so personally it's it's just an expression no, I love it. I love it. I love how you express it. It's it's just just beautiful. You like, said, or for example, <laughs> teenagers. The same thing. You label teenagers, so you know that everyone between um, I think thirteen and nineteen. You could also say everyone between thirteen and nineteen. <laughs> They are beautiful. Jürgen, uh, not Jürgen, because he is not in the room. But <laughs> Sin Fong, do you have some questions? I think it's too many, too, too many questions. <laughs> I don't think that's enough time for us to discuss. Just ask a few. It's okay. We have a little time to ask a few questions. <laughs> uh, I believe in general, uh, I have been saying that for a long time, generation gap is actually originally created by the older generation. The reason is very simple. The younger generations never witnessed how we lived before, and therefore they, hope they have no idea how we live, how we live, what, we, what sort of culture we went through. However, as an older generation, we are living in their time. We know exactly what is happening in the world. We know how they behave. And, and that's the reason why it is very important for the older generation to learn more about the younger generation. It's not about the needs. It's about what's going on, how to integrate yeah. with them. I did mention something before in the last, um, I think, interview. And I, I, a lot of times people use the word diversity inclusion. I believe that diversity unity, uh, unity uh, is more important because as far as you're concerned, we don't just include them for the sake of including them because it is not good Thank enough. You. Thank you. Thank you. I totally agree. Not just for the sake of including them. When we talk about diversity in general, I always say like, I am not creating a diverse workforce just for the sake of doing it because I truly believe that it has potential and that is it fosters innovation, it increases competitiveness, it depicts our real society, which is also important. There's also another topic talking about um, artificial intelligence, right? Because the majority of the population is lacking in these studies and those development. It can be a major danger in the future for our society, right? And not just talking about diversity for the sake of talking about it, or for the sake of um, recruiting diverse um, people. It's because we truly need it and because it's important for our future. So thank you for this input, Sin Jinfo. Yeah, definitely. So is there any other question so far? I think we are good. Jürgen is saying that uh, he, he's, he is comparing it to the zodiac signs that describing personalities and characters and empiric data often is described as non-scientific, but uh, for Jürgen, it's true. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> 
fantastic statement. So, well, um, my concluding remark is if all generations in the workplace act together instead of against each other, completely new paths and doors open up for everyone involved. I also want to tell you that uh, we'll be again at the Global Empowerment Summit on Saturday. I'll be joined by two of my colleagues. It will be very exciting. We will come up with common, uh, so to say, prejudices and discuss it with our audience, what they feel about that. So we'll be representing different generations without overusing it. So one colleague will be from the Generation X, me, myself from Generation Y, and another one from Generation Z. So looking forward to it. It will be on Saturday, same time. And thank you for your participation and being here. And feel free to connect with me, for instance, on LinkedIn. And thank you, Andrea, for engaging with me, Shin Fong, Jürgen Bubeck, and anyone else. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm really, really thankful for you for doing this. And I knew that I have to go to you if it's all about generations. You are the person to go to. So if people are really interested in generations and how they work and how can you improve your, your workforce generation inclusion, please, please reach out to Irene because she's the go-to person. So I'm closing this conversation. Thank you very much for, for being here, Irene. Thank you, Jürgen, and thank you, Simfong. <laughs> for being here almost at every session and listening to this and learning and, and thank you very much.